Um, thank you very much, everybody, for um, asking us to talk here today. I'm the Liz Price of this uh, this double act. We, as, as Charlotte said, we've we've been working on this project together for some time now, so often present um, together. Um, in light of uh, Sarah's admonishments to keep to time and, and avoid a more discursive discussion, we will be reading some of the some of the work we're presenting today. Um, we should also say that, that a lot of the ideas in this paper have, have already been published in, in Health relatively recently, so anybody who's read that will recognise some of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, I um, wanted to start by um, acknowledging the work of, of one of our friends, actually, Erika Elk, who's a South African artist who produced um, a series of etchings in response to the 9-11 disaster. Um, and this is, this is one of the etchings that we have here today. We've kind of pinched the idea of falling um, and, and vertigo in, in, in the context of, of uh, thinking about some of our ideas today. So first apologies for, uh, for, for pinching for pinching direction to do that. Um, the, the project that we've been working on, as Charlotte said, is, is looking at the, the notion of long-term health conditions, uh, particularly thinking about how, how people um, accommodate or resist illness. Um, in, in the context of being ill long term, and we've been looking particularly at systemic lupus. Um, the, the, the broad themes of, of the, the project are, are here on this, on this first slide. Um, so as I, said, as I just said, how people accommodate, how people resist this notion of illness. And the, the things we're going to talk about this morning relate largely to the second point here, and that's how people navigate encounters with professionals how they navigate in particular the diagnostic process and, and the clinical encounter. Um, a further theme was, um, and one we presented on fairly, fairly recently also, is, is, is the family, care, intimacy, how, how those issues are impacted by, by chronic illness. Mm -hmm. And also how people, how people just simply live, how people encounter the everyday um, with, with illness on board. Um, our social workers were also keen to understand the role of formal and informal support networks for people with lupus as well. So that's, that's the project in, in a nutshell. The, um, this is the, oh yes, please, the, the methodology. Um, effectively in, th in three principal phases with, with a bit of an add-on at the end. The first phase, as Liz is going to show you now, was we developed a research blog. Um, and effectively, we went online for three months and invited people with, with a diagnosis, or they felt a diagnosis of lupus, to, to respond to, us, to those themes that we, we put up just now. Um, we were amazed at how, how popular the blog became and how people responded to the blog. People told us the most intimate details about uh, other stories here. And we made a commitment to respond in real time to that. So we had a very, very busy three months that seemed, for me at least, without any sleep, um, as we responded to people's, to people's stories on there. Um, the second phase, we will talk about the blog more if anyone's interested in that particular method um, later on. The second phase was, was standard interviews with people with lupus and their partners. Um, and we're still involved in, in doing a number of focus groups with people too. Um, we also asked people to whether they'd be interested in drawing or artistically representing their, their health condition for this piece of work. And I think, again, we very fortuitously um, found ourselves working with a number of respondents who were artists. Um, so we have had some really wonderful artwork um, back as, as part of the data set as well. So that, that effectively was what the methodology. Um, we're aware this morning that there will be lots of people here who are familiar with autoimmune conditions more broadly and, and clearly lupus in particular. But for anybody who isn't, um, perhaps we could just give you some sense of, of what lupus is and, and, and how that affects the body. Um, lupus is a systemic condition, so it can affect any part of the body. So uh, there's a whole range of um, symptoms that go, go together to make the, the diagnostic criteria. Those can be skin rashes, um, sensitivity to the, to the sun, Maynard syndrome, that's a circulatory disorder. Um, people get ulcers in their mouths, in their nose, um, they, they get inflammation on the linings of the organs in the body, um, can have a range of arthritis, renal disorders, neurological disorders, disorders of the blood, which is often where lupus is, is diagnosed. Effectively, any part of the body can be affected by this condition 
it, it's, it's a condition wherein the body is effectively attacking itself. Well, if all of those symptoms are needed to, to effectively diagnose lupus, and the diagnostic criteria appear to be relatively simple, but actually in practice diagnosing lupus is, is really, really hard, or it appears to be. And lupus is known as the great imitator in that it can it does imitate lots of other lots of other conditions. And the, the whole range of symptoms and the way they're very transient in nature um, means it's a condition characterized by symptomatic uncertainty, a, a flux and a change is always happening in, in lupus. So unsurprisingly that creates a whole range of diagnostic dilemmas, both for patients and, and practitioners. And in, in the course of the work we've been doing, we've come to think about lupus uh, and autoimmunity more broadly, really, as a, as a sort of resident biological insurgent. There are lots of warfare metaphors used when talking about autoimmunity and lupus in particular. But what, what we've sensed is that this, this insurgent um, characterizes the existence of what we've termed that this pathogen, pathogenic cell. Um, so in other words, for the person with lupus, it's, it's their own body which is in, intolerable, it's their own body which they're at war with. And so we, we feel that the biological self is, is a pathogen. Um, as, as we've just said, um, diagnosis in, in lupus is, is particularly complex, but so too is the, the contemporary illness and social context within which that diagnosis is taking place. <coughs> Um, so the context we refer to is, is one where illness is increasingly visible, more generally, and the lines that delineate health and illness um, are increasingly vague. Illness, as, as Bauman has suggested to us, permanent accompaniment of health, its other side, and an always present threat. So lupus is a perfect example of that threat, because for people with lupus, um, it is a ubiquitous presence, even when not acutely ill. People with lupus live with the possibility of varied and worsening symptoms at any one time. But lupus also serves to effectively undermine how we understand um, the function of diagnosis, which ordinarily, as Anne-Marie Dufel has pointed out, sits at a salient juncture between illness and disease, patient and doctor, complaint and explanation. And it's at this juncture that patients and professionals um, traditionally um, anticipate um, what Dutal calls the diagnostic moment. But what we found in the context of, of lupus um, is that diagnosis isn't a clinical event, but actually it's a rather protracted journey um, that unfolds very gradually, sometimes over many years and sometimes not at all. Um, so, that, so the diagnostic process tends to shift and unsettle um, the ways in which we conceive of diagnosis, or, or certainly it did for us in, in, in the context of, of our study, um, in part for the very reason that it's lacking a diagnostic moment. The diagnostic journey um, in lupus, we, we've said, is characterized by what we've described as a sense of, of vertigo. And in tandem with other autoimmune conditions, Lupus constitutes a particularly enigmatic diagnostic and illness experience for both patients and practitioners alike. So, like, like Andrea Stockel, we also suggest that it's a condition that has the potential to create existential insecurity and uncertainty um, on both sides of the clinical encounter, exacerbated by the challenges presented um, by the diagnostic process. So for many, the process of, diagnostic, of diagnosis constitutes the illness journey. And we hope that the experiences of the respondents that we're now going to talk about will give you some sense of, 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 of the vertigo that, that it is that we're talking about. These are the different themes that, that some of our, our respondents have, have spoken about. And, and the balance of our presentation today is really focusing on, on, on the patient voice. We, we've privileged respondents' voices um, over our own in the context of, of the thematic of, of the day. So the first one we wanted to, to, to highlight, and you're likely to get vertigo trying to read that, so um, in the interest of preventing that, I, I, I'm just going to take you, take you through this. Um, this is Jen. She, she's talking about a typical account of some of the challenges that our, our respondents face. She, she went into hospital suffering from chest pain and generalised weakness. And this is, this is how she describes her experience. 
She says, I couldn't move or speak coherently and I had a rash all over my body which looked perfectly red. They thought I had Guillain Barre syndrome and then a stroke. Then MS, and I was in hospital for a three week period. They even said, perhaps my problem is psychiatric. This did upset me as I felt it was all in my head and not real pain I was feeling. I did think I was going mad. I discharged myself and went home, but I needed social services intervention to help uh, to come in and, uh, with the cooking and the cleaning. And, it, and that went on for nearly six months, and she said it was awful. After this, I just kept getting bronchitis, chest infections, pleurisy, viral infections, and so on. And all the hospital said was to take paracetamol and bed rest. I was then told I was having migraine seizures. Then I was referred to a rheumatologist who did prescribe caffeine, which is a common drug of choice in the test of weeks. Due to my skin rashes um, in the sun and my joint pains, they concluded that I had a lupus-like illness, but were reluctant to fully diagnose this. I'm now 38. I've had to leave full-time jobs at least three times due to this. Um, another account that, that, that kind of illustrates this, this sense of amaze um, in lupus from, from a respondent called Heather, uh, that illustrates this complexity in, in diagnosing the condition when you've got all these bewildering symptoms and for some people bewildering clinical responses too. Heather said, from the age of about 23, I'd suffer from episodes of chronic fatigue, joint pain, depression and general malaise. And I put these down to viral illnesses caused by stress and being run down, etc. as I had a really busy life. During my first marriage, when these episodes occurred, my then husband would say I was lazy, attention seeking and a hypochondriac. And after my divorce, eight years ago, these episodes became more frequent and severe. And although at times blood tests did show high inflammatory markers, I was never tested for autoimmune-specific bloods or referred even to a rheumatologist. Hence, I still attributed this to stress and being run down. This was despite the fact that I needed maximum doses of paracetamol and ibuprofen every day just to get through the working day. And then the pain and fatigue would only really ease after a couple of glasses of wine in the evening. I moved house a fair bit between five and eight years ago, and with each new GP I did mention my symptoms, which were really concerning me at this stage. However, the diagnoses varied from ME, depression, viral illness, hypochondria, and even alcoholism. After the birth of my youngest daughter four years ago, my joint pain, fatigue, and malaise were really severe and, and remained so. And when my daughter was nine months, I was seen in surgery by an ex-colleague who was really shocked at my decline and immediately referred me to a rheumatologist. I was diagnosed and commenced treatment at that first appointment, but was also told I'd probably had lupus for about 15 years. What Heather's narrative also pointed, points to here is another very common theme um, in our respondents' experiences, and that was the tendency for practitioners to use psychogenic explanations um, for signs and symptoms if they struggled to fit into existing clinical frames. So this account from Joe is a particularly stark example of this. There were many, but this is, is uh, <coughs> probably the most, um, the most striking one. She says, my symptoms started at around six months after the birth of my second child, following a severe mastitis infection. The symptoms I had were that I was overwhelmingly tired, I was aching all over with pain that was widespread, and I'd lost a lot of weight over a few months. I had headaches, mouth ulcers, difficulty concentrating, wasn't able to sleep, and generally felt pretty rubbish. I visited my GP with these symptoms after they had persisted for around three months. My GP promptly misdiagnosed me with postnatal depression and sent me off with antidepressants. When my symptoms did not improve, he sent me to a psychiatrist who threatened to have me sectioned because I wasn't getting better quickly enough. And when I said I wasn't depressed, he said I was saying that because I was depressed. So I pretended to be better, as the thought of being sectioned when I had a toddler and a baby did not strike me as a good option. I feel that being misdiagnosed with a mental illness for several years was damaging, because A, it meant I wasn't getting medical treatment that would have improved my illness, and I do wonder if my lupus would be less severe if I'd been treated correctly earlier. B, being labelled with a mental illness diagnosis was very, very hard. Nobody listened to me, and I was given drugs that didn't help. And when I wasn't getting better, I was threatened with section and ECT treatment. I feel as though the diagnosis I was given 
stop the medical profession from looking beyond that label of mental illness and interpreting all of my signs within the context of that original diagnosis. So for Joe and other respondents, accounts of their condition were treated with caution. Their own narratives and understandings of illness were marginalized and quite often discounted, and their voices were quite silent in the medical encounter, which appeared to become, for lots of our respondents, very much a one-way process. In the absence of a clinically sanctioned diagnosis, some people did manage to wrest a degree of control back from the clinical encounter by arming themselves with information, quite often from an online context, and effectively diagnosing themselves. So for some people, this served to generate a degree of control over the bewildering diagnostic process and seemed to amount to them assuming the role of a proto-professional through their route to self-management and a more controlled experience, very much dependent on the ability of a clinician's readiness to surrender their paternalistic approach to diagnosis and management, and to more readily embrace some of the uncertainties that conditions such as lupus present. We were, um, we were down in Cambridge um, a few months ago where we were um, invited to speak at, at Adam Woods to a group of, of rheumatologists there. And it was interesting, and in this, this, this notion of uncertainty was, was a real issue for them as well. Um, not that they were, it was something that they wanted to resist, but something that they were increasingly concerned to embrace in, in, in the process of diagnosing lupus in particular. Um, but they, they could see the, the problems that caused for them, and the problems potentially that caused for, for service users as well, who were very keen to, to get some, some answer for what was, what was wrong with them. Um, but, but I think one of the things that our respondents have said to us is that, that it very much depends on who the individual consultant is, whether they're prepared to engage in that the notion of uncertainty with you, or whether they're very certain in their own view that you either have or haven't got lupus. Um, it, it's very much a lottery. And, and I think the, the next quote perhaps exemplifies the, the, that sense of, of, of luck, if you like, in who you're working with. Um, also, it also exemplifies the, this notion of people becoming professionals in, in their own right in terms of managing their own condition. Um, another respondent said, my encounters with the medical profession has been as, have been as varied as the individual professionals themselves. Generally speaking, they fall into two categories. The first is awful frustrating, judgmental, a lack of knowledge, a lack of compassion. And it was encountered <coughs> with professionals like these which considerably delayed my diagnosis and have really hampered my ongoing treatment and management of my disease. The second category, however, is absolutely brilliant. I've also had treatment that's been kind, compassionate and respectful. And I've been treated by professionals who not only have a good knowledge base, but also have the empathy and interpersonal skills to explain diagnosis and treatment in a way that really empowers you. But this is entirely down to the individual, and it's not possible to say whether doctors are better at this or nurses are better. As a nurse myself, I was aware that this might be the situation I would face. What I didn't know was just how important that would be to me. I've left some consultations feeling really empowered and really positive, and others just totally frustrated at a professional's lack of knowledge and understanding. I manage my lupus myself as much as possible out of choice now, and doing so makes me feel more empowered and in control. Well, that said, I only started to assert myself and monitor my own blood, for example, after the lack of monitoring from my rheumatology nurse, and then my GP meant that I developed liver failure. Thankfully, it was reversible. She said that taking a proactive approach to my disease has allowed me to both question and suggest treatment options, plus I view it from a holistic perspective rather than dealing with one symptom or system at a time. I do always feel that my rheumatology nurse is somewhat glad that I know where I am with my disease and what, if anything, needs doing when I see her. With my GP, it seems to be a mutual benefit and she always asks my thoughts and opinions. Unsurprisingly, the journey to diagnosis and beyond has had a profound effect on people's sense of themselves and for their futures. And for Carol, these effects have been particularly telling. She says, SLE, like other chronic illnesses, I believe, can strip the heart right out of you and change you into something you don't recognise in the mirror anymore. Yes, after four years of being diagnosed, I'm still in mourning for the girl <coughs> I once was. Failure, ashamed and guilty are biggies for me. I'm separated from my husband. Sorry, I'm separated because my husband didn't understand the illness and wasn't supportive at all. 
I asked him to leave as part of my de-stressful life campaign. <coughs> that equals a failed marriage. I haven't managed to overcome my illness, remain positive and return to work. I'm not a martyr, but a failure. I'm on incapacity benefit, and I don't foresee a return to any form of career that includes pressure, stress, quick thinking. And I'm on the list for a council property. I'm obese, and my son has just started to say again he does not want to fat mummy anymore. That equals a shame. I've started a diet again. I have two fairly young children who've suffered more than me, really due to the separation and the fact that mummy doesn't have the energy or isn't physically capable to do anything they or I would like to do. And I can't provide for them very well financially or either. That equals guilt. Socialising is a big effort. Not only do I worry about what to wear to cover my bulges, but what to say. I avoid social interaction with people who I don't know well because I hate sounding like an idiot when I word search or say the wrong word or I'm just slow. My memory has been affected and it takes time for me to retrieve the information. <coughs> I'd like to wear a badge saying, I'm not stupid, I'm ill. But that may seem like I'm attention seeking rather than just stating the fact. I've informed my friends whose children go to the same schools as me that if I just pick up the kids and leave or don't join the mums for a chat, it's not because of them in any way, it's just because I'm not feeling well. My actual age is 46. Mentally I feel 28, but physically I feel 80. My mum is 73 and she's far more active with the ability to do much more than me. This in itself leads to lots of mixed emotions. The conclusions that we've come to from our research are that we feel the diagnostic process is perhaps well defined as litigious. A dizzying, spinning sensation characterised by a sense of loss of balance and control which is mediated by the rather arbitrary nature of the clinical encounter and the ways in which a satisfactory patient experience is founded on the vague beliefs of the individual professionals' interpersonal skills and their willingness to allow patients the opportunity to engage in the experience of their own illness. This, what would seem to be a most basic right, demands, however, that professionals' historically sanctioned reliance on clinical paternalism is relinquished. Perhaps it's also necessary to simply work with rather than around patients. It's ironic, on the weekend, I think it was the CEO of NICE talking about the need for patients to be pushing patients mm -hmm. um, in the context of demanding um, medication, I think he, he was referring to. Right. Further, our respondents' narratives illuminate how the complexities of autoimmune conditions in particular pose challenges to the ways in which clinical medicine has traditionally been undertaken. Mm -hmm. In addition, rare conditions like lupus tend not to generate the medical or public interest that would be likely to increase funding for service provision or clinical research. This work was funded by Lupus UK and it's become apparent to us in working with service users and patients across the country that lupus is a little known and poorly understood condition. Increasing specialisation within clinical medicine and the subsequent micro partition of healthcare provision has also resulted in people's experience of care being increasingly fragmented as they are referred to and between many clinical departments in search of diagnosis and appropriate treatment. Our respondents shift between three or four uh, clinical departments on average. In these specialties, people's experiences suggest that there's a tendency to adopt a head in the sand approach to holistic care. That is, clinical specialism is increasingly turned inwards as the science of medicine does the same. As a result, the body is gradually decontextualized, deconstructed and compartmentalized into increasingly minute components that become difficult to reconstitute into human wholes. It would seem that professionals, understandably, under these circumstances, and the pressures of working in resource limited contexts, find it difficult to actually perceive a whole person. Working with diagnostic uncertainty for the practitioner and the patient, who, like lots of our respondents, have said, I just want to know what's happening to me, demands an uncomfortable shift from traditional patient and practitioner roles and expectations particularly in the context of diagnosis. So for conditions like lupus, which have uncertain etiologies and outcomes, and that are by definition fragmented and difficult to reconcile, it's perhaps not surprising that these circumstances, we think, generate a rather vertiginous state. Thank you. <laughs>